Very exciting to be here at Calvary for a couple of reasons. One right off the bat is that this is one of the few churches in America where I get to speak without subtitles. So uh, thank you, uh, Dr. John Monroe, for setting the stage and helping you tune into the frequency of the Scottish accent. Uh, Dr. John Monroe and I uh, are good friends, have been good friends for a while, and I've got such a great respect and appreciation for his ministry. Uh, when I travel and speak, my own family at the moment are in San Diego, California. That's where we live. I'm married to the beautiful Cheryl, and we have three wonderful children. Uh, Sophia's the eldest. She's 16 and a half. Uh, she's just getting behind the wheel of a car, so appreciate your prayers for the other road users. No, I'm only kidding. But um, Mariah turns 15 tomorrow, and we have Asher, our son, who turned nine last weekend. And so they're a wonderful family, and we're in this ministry together in every way, and it's a great blessing uh, to be serving the cause of Christ. We actually spent a few months attending the church here in 2011. We had relocated from Scotland to the United States of America, and we spent about four or five months here. I was finishing writing the book, uh, and as we, we stayed here, we were attending uh, the church here at Calvary. And we were attending here and really enjoying the, the, the ministry here at Calvary. And one of the reasons that we wanted to come, and not just come, but have our son Asher dedicated here, he was dedicated here in 2011, was the, the passion for this congregation, the way that this congregation has caught the vision for the Great Commission. And we love that. And we also love the, the leadership. We love Dr. John Monroe and his passion for the authority of the Word of God. And I would suggest that Dr. John Monroe has two essential characteristics that we need in Christian leaders today, which is why I warm to him so much and respect him. And that is that he has the gentleness of a lamb and the heart of a lion. The Lord knows we need such Christian leaders today the gentleness of a lamb and the heart of a lion. And that reflects Jesus. It's not easy being a Christian today. It's not easy surviving as a church in the culture today. And there are many challenges that we face, and so I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. As Jim shared, Cheryl and I have the great honor of working with Josh McDowell. Josh has been a friend for a number of years. We'd relocated to San Diego as our ministry was going into Asia Pacific. And a couple of years ago, Josh and his team invited us to join with them. And so we have the great honor of serving with Josh McDowell Ministry under the umbrella of Crew. And it's a great delight to be part of the JMM family. And our commitment is to shine the light and to share the truth of the gospel until the whole world hears. It's a global commitment because everyone around this world needs to hear the gospel, and we are just honored to have an opportunity to connect and communicate that. Uh, my passion really is building bridges, helping people build bridges into conversations that count so that we can talk about things that really matter. That's not always easy in the world we live in today, but that's my passion. And as I do that, I'm so thankful the way that the gospel does reach around the world. In fact, it reached into Scotland many years ago when I was a young boy, and I'm so thankful for that. I was born into a family in Scotland in the city of Edinburgh. Uh, my family were not Christians, really weren't interested in God or Christianity. But uh, as we were being raised in this family, my parents had a bit of a stormy marriage. It wasn't a, a great setting for my sister Paula and I growing up. My mom was only five foot two, a little Scotswoman, but she had a bit of a temper. In fact, she was almost a black belt in Taekwondo. So my father learned to respect her very quickly, but that marriage wasn't an easy one. And by the time I was three years old, my parents came to my sister and I and said, listen, we're, we're splitting apart. And my parents were divorced. So my sister and I went to live with my mother. My dad really returned to the single life, visiting us on the weekends when the bars were closed. And that was my life. And that's the way I thought it was going to be until something happened. God intervened. A neighbor invited my mom to church. Now, if you had a list of the likely people to go to church, my mom would not be on that list. 
but she went to church and she heard the gospel, something she'd never heard and understood before. And she went back the next week and she committed her life to Christ. And she changed. <laughs> she changed so much that people who knew her before and afterwards were captivated and tried to figure out what has happened to you? Why are you different? My dad, more than anyone, said, what happened to the woman I was married to? My dad was so curious, he started to attend the church, and my dad ended up coming to Christ. And the whole dynamic of our family changed in a positive direction, to the point my mom and dad took my sister and I aside and said, we're, we're getting remarried to each other. When I was nine, I got to go to my mom and dad's wedding. <laughs> I am in the wedding album. And uh, I didn't take up John's challenge to preach in a kilt today. He did challenge me. I, I declined. You'll be glad to know. But I did wear a kilt at my mom and dad's wedding and my own wedding as well. But that transformation, that change happened um, because of God's work in our, our situation. And that's when I committed my life to Christ as a nine-year-old boy. And I was so thankful for what God had done. I mean, I got my dad back, our family was back together, and I was so excited about this. I wanted to share it with other people. But as I got into my teenage years, I realized not every family gets back together. In fact, even Christian families can fall apart. And so much of my testimony was weighted upon this good outcome. As a teenager, I started to struggle. I started to wrestle with difficult questions. Is Christianity for you if it works for you? And if it doesn't work for you, then you should try something else. Because many other people I knew, they didn't get the happy ending. What did I have to say to those people? Well, I started to drift away from God. I started to shelve my questions, which is not the best thing to do, which is why I do what I do now to encourage people to ask those questions, the most difficult questions. But I shelved them and I started to drift away from God until God intervened in our life in a difficult way when my sister nearly died. And through those circumstances, I'm so glad to say my sister recovered, but that was a game changer for me. That was when God brought me back. That was when I was ready to commit to Him wholeheartedly with everything. If you're familiar with the story of the prodigal son, you'll know that he only returned to his father when there was nowhere else to go. And yet even then, the father welcomed him back with open arms. I experienced that goodness and grace of God and was so thankful for it. There's a beautiful description in the writing of G.K. Chesterton that I think captures something about the beauty of the way that God works with a broken world full of broken people. I caught him with an unseen hook and an invisible line, which is long enough to let him wander to the ends of the world and still bring him back with a twitch upon the thread. God brought me back, and I was so thankful I was so thankful, I was so appreciative. And I realized for the first time how we build a strong foundation for our faith. I love how Os Guinness put it. Christianity is not true because it works. Christianity works because it's true. Christianity is not true because it works. It works because it's true. And when I had that in my mind, I realized this is where we build our foundation. The popular culture encourages us to be pragmatic. It's all about convenience. Find what works for you. Well, here's the problem. We're not always sure what is good for us, particularly in the long run, particularly from an eternal perspective. Well, God help me discover the ultimate foundation for our faith is building our life on the truth and on the one who is the way, the truth, and the life, Jesus Christ. You want to stand strong in your faith? You build your life on the truth and the one who is the truth. Well, my passion for over 15 years in a dozen countries around the world is bringing this message of hope, bringing the good news of the gospel. But maybe you've noticed, when we talk about Jesus and share who he is, it brings some resistance. Even in America, resistance, opposition, 
hostility to the gospel. Well, this is Super Bowl Sunday. For Dr. John Monroe and I, it's not such a big deal. Last Saturday was a big deal when Aberdeen, his team, was playing against Hibernian, my team, in Edinburgh. I wasn't going to bring that up because Aberdeen actually won, which I'm glad he's not around at the moment this weekend because I'm sure he would be giving me a hard time. But Super Bowl Sunday is a great day in America for sports. And as the events of today unfold, I won't be surprised to hear talk about God, players, coaches, maybe even talk about their faith in Jesus. But you know when that happens, some people don't like it. (laughs) Even when you watch the response and reactions of the networks, you realize some people are uncomfortable with this. Why are they doing this? There seems to be an unwritten rule in our society, a new commandment has been declared. It is this, when it comes to religion, particularly Christianity, thou shalt keep thy beliefs to thyself. When it comes to religion, particularly Christianity, thou shalt keep thy belief to thyself. Have you felt the weight of that new commandment? Have you felt the pressure of that? Well, there's a serious problem with that new commandment. I love G.K. Chesterton. His writing is imagery. He would say this statement is a good example of someone sawing off the branch they're sitting on. They're sawing off the branch they're sitting on. As soon as they uttered this statement, they have just defeated that statement, and here's why. If you say when it comes to religion, we should keep our beliefs to ourselves. The person who uttered these words is not keeping their belief to themselves about religion. They just shared their belief with other people. They just did what they said we should not do. You know the genius of it? They got to share their view, but they shut down anybody else who dare disagree with them. Wow, isn't that powerful? Can you see why that's so popular? If people say when it comes to religion, we need to keep our beliefs to ourselves, help others see that in saying this, they are not keeping their belief to themselves. They're actually sharing their belief with other people. They're doing what they just said we should not do. And then say, we want to live in a more open, tolerant society, so we appreciate them and give them the right to share and express their view. But we hold on to the right to do the same. Some people may need to go away and think about that when you share it with them. But we need to sow seeds of truth in this culture of confusion. As Christians, we are increasingly engaged in a battle to speak truth. And whenever we go against the grain, you're going to feel the rub. Whenever you go against the flow of the culture, you're going to feel the pressure, the opposition, you're going to feel the squeeze. And this is the context of the verse we're going to be focusing on today. This opposition, this hostility, because when you feel the squeeze of the culture, it can instill fear. It can encourage you to sit down and keep your mouth closed. We're going to see Peter's words this morning encourage us. We don't have to bend. We don't have to buckle. We can stand strong. We can walk tall and share our faith with confidence. If you have your Bibles with you this morning, the passage we're looking at, and the verse in particular, comes from 1 Peter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3. I'm going to read verses 13 to um, 16. This is reading from the ESV. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for righteousness' sake, you will be blessed. Have no fear of them, nor be troubled. Here's the key, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and respect, having a good conscience, so that when you're slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. Peter's first letter here, likely written from Rome in the early 60s, We know that he uh, was martyred for his faith. Shortly after this, he's writing toward the end of his life, and he's writing to Christians who he knows are dealing with opposition, who are facing persecution. And he wants to write to encourage them in the midst of this situation. 
So we can see certainly that there is application in our lives today. I love working with with students and young people largely because they're at a point in their life where they're really looking at life and they're looking for answers, willing to wrestle with some of the tough questions. And so I get excited how the Bible can help us make sense of the world. It can help us make sense of others. It helps us make the best sense of ourselves. This is wonderful that we have God's Word available for us. And what I often do when I'm working with people, I encourage them to to look at life like a giant jigsaw puzzle. A giant jigsaw puzzle. The beauty of the jigsaw puzzle is as I travel, it transcends culture. People know what a jigsaw puzzle is. They know how it works. And it's not too difficult to look at life like a giant jigsaw puzzle because this world is in a mess. And we're surrounded by all these pieces, too many to count. But here's the problem. We know we're never going to find all the pieces of this puzzle. You know what's amazing and simple about a jigsaw puzzle? If you want to see the big picture, you don't need every single piece of a puzzle in place. If you want to see the big picture, you don't need every single piece of a puzzle in place. Well, that's good news for us because suddenly there's hope of finding ultimate answers because you don't need to know everything to know the truth. God has revealed things to us. He wants us to find those ultimate answers. He wants us to see the big picture. And if we can learn to look at life and to see the big picture and share that with other people, can you imagine someone that you know that is not a Christian? Maybe you're here this morning. When you start to get a sense of what the big picture of life is. Imagine you could leave today knowing what life is about, knowing the meaning of life, knowing the big picture. That would change everything. And that is what God wants us to share with the people around us. Young people are hungry for ultimate answers. Young people are hungry for ultimate answers. All too often the problem is Christians are answering the wrong questions. Now, if Christians are answering the wrong questions, why would people be interested? If you're answering questions people are not asking, why would they be interested? We wonder that sometimes. Well, the good news of this is that the Bible addresses the questions people are asking, are wrestling with, life's ultimate questions. The questions that seem out of reach, the jigsaw reminds us, may be within reach because you don't need to know everything to know the truth. You don't know every piece of the puzzle to see the big picture. So maybe we can look at some of those questions that people have shelved and thought are out of reach. Where did we come from? Imagine someone could know, someone walking around the streets of Charlotte today or across America, across the world, imagine they could know where we came from. Really? What about why we're here? Just think the meaning of life. For Christians, you know, you've found the meaning of life. Did you wake up this morning, jump out of bed, I've found the meaning of life? Or like me, did you roll out and think, is it that time already? We can take for granted. Think of the people around the world that would love to know the meaning of life. We have found the meaning of life. We want to share that with other people. Oh, so where are we going? What about the future? Is there hope? (laughs) Not in this world. Which is why people in this world do everything they can to not think about what is to come because there is no hope in this world. What a joy that we have the gospel that brings hope to people, something that we long for. These are great things that we have to share to build bridges into conversations that count so we can talk about things that really matter. My middle daughter, Mariah, was attending public school, and it was coming up to career day. And I said to Mariah, I said, I wonder if I could come into your school for career day. Well, she was excited, and I got invited to come and talk about what I do. This is what I do. (laughs) So I got to go into this middle school classroom with these non-Christian, unchurched middle school kids. 
And I got to talk to them about the truth about the Christian worldview. I don't know if that would get you out of bed in the morning, but let me say, that is something that I get very excited about. And so I was able to come across these young people and share. And you may expect apathy or opposition. Can I tell you that this class was gripped? These young people were hanging on what I was saying. Because I was able to say to them, you know what? There's a way of looking at this life, way of looking at this world, way of looking at others, way of looking at yourself, that you're not an insignificant speck in this vast universe. You have absolute value. You are special because God made you in His image. Life isn't just meaningless. There is a meaning to life. It's built around relationships. But people today say, I long for relationships, but I can't find the relationship I'm looking for. They're starting to get the picture. <laughs> this world doesn't have, ultimately, the relationship we're looking for. It is out of this world. But when you have that relationship with God, it filters into every other relationship that we have. Where are we going? Is death just the end of everything? Why is it when someone dies, I find it hard, I find it difficult, I wish that they could live longer, my loved ones, if they could live even longer. In fact, imagine which the society and the culture and the media says, imagine people could live forever. Yes, God has put eternity in our hearts, which is why we long for more than this. You see why I get excited to go into a public school and to share this with eighth grade students? They're not getting this in the school. They're not getting this in the culture. Well, I loved to share with them, and what was amazing was the teacher got them to fill out comment cards, and I was so moved to read their comments. They were engaging with this. But let me tell you, my heart was breaking because there were other students on that campus that have never heard. There are students across the country who have never heard, across the world who have never heard. Who's going to tell them? Who's going to teach them? God wants you and He wants me to reach out to the people around us. God's given us a message of hope. And this letter, Peter, Peter was an ordinary fisherman. Peter was someone who let God down on many occasions. We should write him off. God redeemed him, restored him, empowered him to reach the people around him. In fact, to change the world. God's Word says to you and to me this morning, I want you to reach the people around you. You might say, well, I'm just an ordinary person. I've let God down. Well, you're in good company. God says, I want to redeem you, restore you, and empower you to reach the people around you. In fact, to change the world. Today, everyone in this room, everyone watching this, you can be a world changer. Not based upon what we have to offer, but what God has done and said, revealed, communicated, that we get to be the bearers of His good news. We need to be prepared to share. I love how the NIV puts this verse, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Well, Peter says, we are going to face opposition, but don't worry, don't fear. Be prepared to be empowered. Be prepared to be empowered. He says, but set apart Christ as Lord, but in your hearts, set apart Christ as Lord. In the life of every, every believer, every Christian, know this, it starts in the heart. It starts in the heart. It's said many times, the heart of the matter is the matter of the heart, and we know that the heart is critical. The Bible talks a lot about the heart. We've been singing this morning about the heart, but we have to be careful because the culture also talks about the heart, and it means something very different. I don't know how many times as a family we've watched movies, particularly some animated movies, and in these movies, the storyline unfolds, and it reaches a point where the main character has to make a big decision, and this decision is made with the encouragement to do one thing before they make that decision, to make sure it's the right decision. What is it they have to do? They have to do this. They have to listen to their heart. 
Listen to their heart. What does that translate as in the culture? Look inside and follow your feelings. Look inside and follow your feelings. Well, we're witnessing a generation that has been raised with the right and the remit to navigate life by listening to their heart, by looking inside and following their feelings. And what is the result? It is utter chaos and confusion. Why is it so attractive to look inside and to follow your feelings, to listen to your heart? Well, here's five very quick reasons. Number five, if we live life by following our feelings, number five, it doesn't take much effort. Well, that's attractive right off the bat. Number four, if you live by following your feelings, you get to do what you want. Wow, this is getting really good now. This is heating up. Number three, if you live by following your feelings, you get to do what you want and believe you're doing what's right. I mean, it doesn't get any better than this. Number two, if you live by following your feelings, no one can criticize you because you didn't choose your feelings. Your feelings chose you. Number one, if you live by following your feelings, Others have to leave you alone because we all retreat into our own little bubble. See the attraction? The attraction of this? Many people are drawn into this and captivated by this. If you meet someone who espouses this, you need to sober them up pretty quickly. I was having a conversation recently with someone who was talking along these lines, and I said, you don't really believe that. He kind of looked at me. I said, you don't really believe that. You don't really believe the human trafficker you know, should just follow his feelings and listen to his heart, that he should be taking advantage and exploiting some of the most weak and vulnerable members of our society, even if it makes them happy. I said, you don't believe that. You don't believe that. And so he started to backtrack because he was a nice guy. He didn't want to endorse the abuse and exploitation of others. And so when I was talking to him, he was starting to think and he was starting to be steered back into the right direction. This kind of fuzzy sentiment, we need to help people see clearly the consequences of that way of looking at the world, because every worldview has consequences. And the one that we're seeing today in our culture leads to chaos, leads to confusion. The Bible talks a lot about the heart, but when the Bible talks about the heart, it doesn't mean our feelings, it means everything. It means engaging our mind and our emotions and our will. If you were to substitute feelings in any biblical passage where it says heart, it wouldn't make sense. Now, it includes our feelings, but also it engages our mind. We need to make sure that we do that so that we don't go astray like we see in the culture, clearing up that confusion. Now, feelings and emotions, they're God-given. They're wonderful. I mean, I can't imagine life without them. And God can communicate to us with a feeling or with a sense. You think about the peace of God that may be confirmation of a decision that you're weighing. Or think about the conviction of the Holy Spirit that might steer you away from going down the wrong road. But the point is you do not disengage those emotions from the mind that God has given you. You fuse them together and you love God and you follow God and you worship Him with everything. That's what it means when we give our heart to Jesus. That is what the Bible tells us. Peter says, you can shine in the face of opposition. The start is the heart. You set apart Christ as Lord. Bob Dylan wrote a song and said, everybody's serving somebody, and I think he was right. But for the Christian, we serve, as we sang earlier this morning, Christ alone. He is the one we look up to. He is the one that we hold on to. He is the one we build our life upon. We set apart Christ as Lord. And when you do that, something amazing happens. Set apart, the word can be translated sanctify, be made holy. And as we set apart Christ as Lord, the one who is holy, the one that we look up to, then something amazing happens because Christ who we love and who we follow, he comes and indwells us. He starts to change us. He starts to make us like Him. He starts to sanctify us so that we start to look like Him. Paul wrote in Galatians 5, famously, what this looks like, we get to experience God's love, His joy, His peace, His patience, His kindness, His goodness, His faithfulness, His gentleness, His self-control. 
the fruit of the Spirit, the signs and the evidence of someone who's spiritually alive. But if you look at other religions, it seems like Christianity, you got it the wrong way around. Other religions tell you, you have a guidebook, you have instructions, you follow these, you do these on the outside to try and be the right person on the inside. Christianity stands apart from all other religions that says there's nothing you can do on the outside to become the right person on the inside. You come as you are. You humble yourself before God, and you watch Him get to work on the inside, and then your life starts to look different on the outside. Other religions are outside in. Christianity is inside out, remarkably different. And that's where we get our hope and our assurance. Can you imagine these other religions? People striving to do their best with no idea if they're going to be good enough. And Christianity says, no, (laughs) the most important thing is not what we can do for God, but what God has done for you. Our assurance is not in ourselves. Our assurance is in Him, responding to what He has done, accepting what He has done. Well, there's no natural explanation for the transformation that we see in the lives of people who love Him and who follow Him. And it's not easy in the culture. It's not easy in the culture, but we are empowered to be different. Uh, Again, looking at the words of G.K. Chesterton, who said, a dead thing can go with the stream, but only a living thing can go against it. A dead thing can go with the stream, but only a living thing can go against it. You're empowered to be counter-cultural, to go against the flow, not just to be some kind of chameleon that fits in, that blends in. That's the easy option. Christians are called and empowered to be different, to live a life that is different. But as Peter says in chapter 4, verses 3 and 4, you've spent enough time in the past doing what pagans choose to do. They think it's strange that you do not plunge with them into the same food of dissipation, and they heap abuse on you. It's hard to get a hard time for doing the right thing. I mean, okay, we can get a hard time for doing the wrong thing, but if you're doing the right thing and you're getting opposition, it's not easy, and it can instill fear in us. It can instill fear in us. Well, people in the culture are determined to do what they want to do in opposition to what God says. So what do they do? Well, they try and encourage other people to believe it too. Thomas Morris, Christian writer, said this, if we want to believe a lie, we must convince others that it's true. We need comrades in delusion. Rather than change, and rather than do what is right and what is true, we're so determined in this world, unsaved people, to do what they want, that rather than change doing what they want, they need to try and convince everybody else to do what they do, so they get to do what they want and believe that it's right. It's not enough for people today just to do what they want. Their inside is telling them they want to do what is right because even though we're fallen, even though we're broken, still truth is something that is powerful. It's persuasive. No one wants to be thought to be living a lie. But not enough to bow the knee and to follow God's way for many. They are determined to go their own way. Peter says, but in your hearts, when you get this opposition from people that do not like what you do and what you don't do, set apart Christ as Lord. He is the one. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. Jesus is in this kind of Jesus. Jesus is the wise man, good teacher. Oh yeah, he's fine. But you start talking about Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, and suddenly the conversation changes. People don't want that kind of Jesus. And if you start talking about that kind of Jesus, which is the biblical kind of Jesus, people will tell you to sit down and be quiet. There will be opposition. There will be a reaction. Peter says, don't fear. God will empower you to live differently, to shine and share for Him. And if you live differently, well, then you need to be prepared to share because it's going to get people's attention. It's going to get people's attention. Always be prepared to share. Always be prepared to give an answer. To everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. The word answer here is the Greek word apologetics from uh, apologia, from which we get the word apologetics. 
which is not apologizing for anything. It's confidently sharing what we believe and why we believe it. And in the context of this passage, confidently sharing why we can have hope in this world. We can have hope in this world. And that is good news for many people. Maybe you're not confident about having an evangelistic conversation. Maybe these are things that are difficult, but let me tell you, if you feel that way, you're in good company. Most people find it difficult. It's not easy. It's not easy. But apologetics and evangelism, it's for everyone. God wants to use all kinds of people to reach all kinds of people. God wants to use all kinds of people to reach all kinds of people. And if you don't share, who is going to reach someone out there like you? If you don't share, who's going to reach someone out there like you? Be prepared to give an answer, not for everything. Even the best apologists in the world, they don't have an answer for everything. Peter says, you be prepared to share the reason for the hope that you have. If you're a Christian here this morning, why do you have hope? Here's your homework for today. Think about that. Why do you have hope? There's probably lots of reasons, and they all count. And these are things that you can share with other people. These are things you have a responsibility to share with the people around you. And maybe you think, you know what? I'm not sure I can do it. You don't know the family I'm in. You don't know the neighbors I have. Let me offer you some words of encouragement. The Apostle Paul in Acts 17, his famous sermon in Athens, he said this, God determines the times and places that we live for a reason, so that we would seek after him and perhaps find him, though he's not far from each one of us. Consider the implications of this. If you're a Christian here today, the people around you who were influential in you coming to Christ, that was not random. These people were handpicked by God and placed alongside you. You could have been born at any time in history, in any place, in any family. God placed you there specifically as He placed the people around you with salvation in mind. Also, that means you think of the non Christians in your life. You've been handpicked by God and placed alongside them. It's no accident. You know, if you think about the people in your family or neighbors that are tough to reach, God could have put Billy Graham in your family. God could have put Billy Graham next to your neighbor. God didn't do it. God didn't choose Billy Graham. He chose you. You must be pretty special, right? <laughs> God wants to use you to reach the people around you. You're handpicked by God for that purpose, to share the hope that we have, the hope in heaven. Peter's words in 1 Peter 1, 3, and 4, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you. Hope is powerful. You know, people struggle to live without it. Statistics today are troubling when we think about the number of young people suffering from depression, bombarded with medication. Suicide rates are shocking. Now, these are complex issues. There are a number of contributing factors. I understand that, even physiological ones. But I want to set apart for a moment the idea, the worldview that permeates our society that many people grow up with today, and that is that we came here from nowhere, we're here for no reason, and we're going nowhere. Can we consider the implications of that, the impact of that on the mindset of many young people today? Listen to these words. Famous atheist Bertrand Russell famously said this, a very honest approach and consequences of his worldview, a godless perspective, that man is a product of causes which have no prevision of the end they were achieving, that his origin, his growth, his hopes and fears, his loves and beliefs are but the outcomes of accidental collocations of atoms that no fire, no heroism, no intensity of thought and feeling can preserve individual life beyond the grave, that all the labors of the ages, all the devotion, all the inspiration, all the noonday brightness of human genius are destined to extinction and the vast death of the solar system, and that the whole temple of man's achievement must inevitably be buried beneath the debris of a universe in ruins all these things, if not quite beyond dispute, are yet so nearly certain that no philosophy which rejects them can hope to stand. 
Only within the scaffolding of these truths, only on the firm foundation of unyielding despair, can the soul's habitation henceforth be safely built. A foundation of unyielding despair, the consequences of a godless worldview that many people need to be sobered by. And when they grasp this, we are the bearers of good news because we see the world very differently. More recently, the words of Richard Dawkins, well-known atheist, if you, in a universe of blind physical forces, genetic replication, some people are going to get hurt, others are going to get lucky. You won't find any rhyme or reason in it, nor any justice. The universe has precisely the properties we should expect. If there is, at bottom, no design, no purpose, no evil, no good, nothing but blind, pitiless indifference. DNA neither knows nor cares. DNA just is, and we dance to its music. Consequences of a godless worldview that permeates our society and the mindset of many people are growing up with this worldview. We are the bearers of good news. We see the world very differently, and we need to share it. Peter says, as we share it, we share it gently and respectfully. If you don't share it gently and respectfully, Peter says it's better that you keep your mouth closed. But we share with gentleness and respect. And let me close with this. So many people are looking at life and looking for answers. I was teaching a class on my book uh, at a church, and one lady was attending, her name was Betty. Betty was 90 years old. Not a Christian who always thought she had to wait till she could get all her questions answered, till she could know the answers, and then she could make a commitment to something. I said, Betty, you could live another 90 years. You still wouldn't have all the questions answered. You just need to try and see the big picture. Through the course of the class, Betty saw things snapping into place. At the end of the class, she trusted in Christ. She was baptized a few months after. Ashley was 15 years old. She was attending a camp, a high school camp I was speaking at. I was there with Cheryl and the girls when they were a bit younger. And Ashley, as we engaged with her, we could see God was drawing her close and God was working the lives of these young people. It was very exciting. But at the end of the week, she hadn't made a commitment. And so we really committed to pray for her. And I spoke to the youth leader. I said, Ashley, God's really working in our life. We believe God's drawing her. We're going to pray for her. I said, would you do me a favor? If Ashley gets to that point where she makes a decision for Christ, just send me a text. Very simple. Ashley's in the kingdom. We're going to pray for this young girl. Well, we got home that night. The next day I woke up, turned on my phone, text message. Ashley's in the kingdom. She had spoken to one of the youth leaders that night. She had committed her life to Christ. I spoke at her church a couple of months later, got to see her and meet her as a new creation. Her eyes were shining. It was amazing. It was wonderful. But a year later, I got another text message I wasn't expecting. Last night, Ashley was killed in a car accident. 16 years of age, passenger in a car, involved in an accident, killed instantly. The youth leader reached out to me, said, Alec, we, we don't think our family are Christians, but they know Ashley had a real faith, and they're asking if you would take the funeral. <laughs> Let me tell you, that day, oh, my heart was heavy. I stood inside the chapel. I saw a large group of people assembling outside, and as they filed their way in, many young people, there was standing room only in this auditorium. What did I have to say? I got nothing, but God had something. Can I tell you, I was charged up that day. Oh, it was just, turn the hose on. Let me share some hope that we have in this world that has no hope. And I talked about Ashley's faith, her confidence in Christ, the relationship with God that she had, which meant that although she had died, she is living and she is with God and her hope is a hope that we can have. And what I love about the gospel is that this isn't just wishful thinking. Let's just make up something so we feel better. This fits. It's anchored in the real world. It resonates with reality. This makes sense of the world. It makes sense of others. It helps us make sense of ourselves. I got to share that with these young people. What an honor. What a privilege. I was just the messenger of good news, a message of hope that the world desperately needs to hear. Peter says that is our responsibility. God wants us to do that. He wants us to share it with others. Don't fear. The culture is going to come against you. It's going to tell you to sit down and be quiet. But in your hearts, 
set apart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. Are you prepared to share with the people around you? Peter, ordinary fisherman. God uses ordinary people to communicate ultimate truth. Peter let Jesus down. He failed. Jesus didn't write him off. He redeemed him, restored him, and empowered him to reach the people around him, to change the world. Peter's letter references the book of Isaiah a number of times in the opening chapters. I want to leave you with these words from the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, verse 8, well-known words, I'm sure. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Let's pray. Would you pray with me this morning? Heavenly Father, we thank you for the way that you deal with broken people living in a broken world. We thank you for your love, for your compassion. Lord, we thank you that you choose to use us as broken vessels, ordinary people, able to share ultimate truth because we're empowered by you. And we can address those those questions in the world, in life that seem out of reach, that people would love to know, would long to know. And the answers are good news. We can discover who you are, that you made the world and you made us and that you care for us so much that you sent your son into the world to die for us, to build a bridge between heaven and earth, to pay for everything that ought to separate us from a holy God. And you welcome us back into your family. And then you say, you're going to indwell us. You're going to sanctify us. You're going to change us from the inside out. And you're going to give us the power to share this message with others. And we look at this world today that is broken, that is desperately in need to hear a message of hope. Jesus, you are our hope. And I want to pray for each one of us today. May we be willing, like an Isaiah, to say, hey, I've got my failings. I'm not sure what I have to offer, but here I am. Send me. And God, that's all that you want. And you'll begin a work in us and through us to reach out to the people around us, to change the world. And we will give you all the glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen.